Okay, let's do um, the answers for the, the solutions for the practice for test one. Um, so we have a sports writer wishes to conduct a study on average pitch counts. I'm gonna highlight things that stand out to me for starting pitchers in Major League Baseball. He wants to estimate the percentage of time a starting pitcher throws at least 100 pitches in the game. He randomly chooses 500 games, that sounds important, and notes the pitch counts of each of the par uh, starting pitchers. So the population is like a bigger group than the sample. So for me, I noticed that the sample is the 500 games. So then the population is the bigger group. So if 500 games are the sample, then more games are the population. So this would be all Major League Baseball games. Um, and the variable, the variable is the thing that they're recording or noting or writing down, um, the thing they're studying. So I can see that they note pitch count. So that means pitch count is my variable. Um, there's a lot of other stuff, like at least 100 pitches. That's just something beyond the variable. The pitch count is what they note for the sample, and then they calculate more information after that. So an example of the data value is the number of pitches. So there's lots of examples. So it could be there's 900 pitches in a game, not 900, 90 pitches in a game. Um, it doesn't have to be at least 100. They're just interested when it is at least 100. It could also be 150 pitches, right? There's lots of answers here. And classify the variable means what type? So if we're looking at pitches, is it a number or is it in words? It's a number. And then once it's numerical, is it something that we count or is it something that we measure, um, right? If it's something we count, there's gaps, which means only like whole numbers are possible. If it's something we measure, it flows, anything works. So I think with pitches, it can only be whole numbers. We count it. So this is discrete, not continuous. Cool. All right, let's try question two. A teacher is researching how many hours students study per week. Rather than asking all the students to fill out the survey, the teacher randomly samples 10 classes and has them fill out the survey. What sampling method is this? So simple random sampling would be as if we, if we did do all students, which is not what we did. We've decided that's too difficult. Um, so by putting them in classes, we've grouped them together or clustered them. So this is called cluster sampling. My explanation is each class is a cluster. Cool. Let's try number three. All right, I'll let you read this one. It's a mouthful. Um, you should have it in front of you. And then I'll kind of highlight what's important as we go through the examples. So we're going to look at the treatments that are used in the experiment. So the treatments are the groups. So there's a lot of groups. Notice it says six groups which means I have six treatments. So this one's more than what we typically have. So let's try to figure out what all these groups are. So there's four different blogging groups. There's a private diary group, and there's one group who did nothing. So let's start with private diary and nothing. Those are the easier of the four, six. And then there's four blogging groups. So let's figure out what's going on within the blogging. So we have two blogging groups had social problems and two did not. So we have blog with social problems, blog with just blog in general without. And then within those, they either allowed comments or didn't allow comments. So we'll say with comments, without. And that's my six groups. So treatments are the different groups we put them in. All right, and then did it include randomization? So if it doesn't say, we don't know. Um, but if it does say, then we can answer this. So just because it doesn't say doesn't mean we don't know. But let's see. I see some hints towards random. I see they were randomly divided into six groups. 
So yeah. Oops, I don't know why I underlined either of those. Um, replication. Replication just means, um, did it happen more than once? Yep, 161 Israeli high school students. So it was repeated for 161 students. And then we want to find the primary response variable. So the response variable is more like an output or like what we're measuring or recording. So let's see if we can figure out what they're recording. So the blogs are the group. What were they interested in finding out? So I see they're trying to calm anxious teens. That's not quite the variable, but it's definitely giving us an idea. Um, and as I look through it, I see they assess the teen's social anxiety levels before and after. Um, it does say their anxiety improved, but that's not the variable. The variable is just anxiety levels, what they were measuring. Cool. All right, and feel free to pause any time. I'm just going through this quickly um, for everyone to go at their own pace. Um, so let's look at a STEM leaf. Um, so we have 43 students, so that means my total is 43. And we're looking at their GPA. So the class descriptions are like, what? how do we describe each row? So the first row, since we have two leaves per stem, two, two, three, three, four, four, that means we're going by fives. So rather than 1.0 to 1.9, it's 1.5 to 1.9. And I know it's 0.5 because of the 0.1 right here. So then rather than 2.0 to 2.9, we split it up into two rows. So we have 2.0 to 2.4 and 2.5 to 2.9. And again, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.9, all that because of the leaf unit. And then we would have 3.0 to 3.4. Notice every time we go by fives. Um, so 3.0 to 3.5 to 4.0, and then we just end at fours and nines. Um, so the last row represents 4.0 to 4.5, even though we only have 4.0s in it. That's just the data we happen to have. But if we had a 4.4, it would go there. So the class description of the third row, we just go to the third row, and it would be 2.5 to 2.9. If we converted this to a table, what would we get? Now the actual data values is what do these numbers represent? So this helps us if we understand stem leaf. So 2.5 means 2.5. The second 5 and the third 5 are two more students with 2.5s. So we had three 2.5s in this data set. We had a 2.6 and a 2.8. Those are the actual data values. So stem leaves are nicer than other graphs if you want to know the individual data values. All right, and then let's see how many students, what percentage have at least a 3.5. So we know there's 43 total students. So we're going to make it out of 43 because that's my total. And then at least 3.5 is 3.5 or more. And we're going to go to 3.5 or more. And we're just going to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Those are all the people who are 3.5 or above. And we'll just go ahead and divide really quick. 17 over 43 gives me point three nine five three, which is 39.53%. All right, we have a couple more to do. Um, I noticed we're going to find mean and median and standard deviation, so we'll probably pull out the calculator in a second. Um, we have 15 random days, and we have Sophia's diaper usage per day. And we want to get a use of her overall diaper usage. So that hints to me that this is only a sample, which means we'll use X bar and S, not mu or sigma. We use those for populations. So if I want to find the mean and standard deviation and median, I can use the calculator. If you have anything in here, go to the top and hit clear, enter, clear, enter, and we'll enter all the data. 10, 7, 8, 5, 8, 
8, 9, 13, 9, 8, 9, 9, 5, 10, and 10. Notice I have 15 data values. Double check for typos. We'll go to stat. We'll go over to calc. And you go to one var stats, L1. And that should give us A, B, and C. All right, so our mean is the very first one, the one that says X bar, and I get a mean of 8.5. Um, I always just want one more decimal place than the data, so 8.5 works. The median is given at 9. No rounding to worry about because it's just 9. And then the standard deviation, there's two choices. We're going to use um, S, 1.9952. We're not going to use 1.9276 because that would be if it were a population. So for standard deviation, remember we like five digits. So one, two, three, four, five. And then for left skewed, right skewed, or neither, without a graph, we can just compare the mean and standard deviation. So since the mean is smaller than the median, it means it's left skewed. And that's coming from the idea that um, if it's symmetric, they're the same in the middle, and then when it's skewed, the outliers pull the mean. So we're gonna get a longer tail on the left side when the mean is smaller. So hopefully that helps understand that. And then the last thing is which measure of center would be best for planning um, how many more diapers to buy. Um, the mode is really never that useful. Mode is only good for categorical, so that doesn't matter here. We don't categorical. Um, so we want the mean or median. Um, so the mean is better when the total is important. So do we care about total number of diapers? Um, absolutely, right? If you, you want to know how many she's going to use total. So we're going to say the mean because the total is important to us. All right, so six. Um, what I notice in six is I see things like unusual and expected range. Um, that makes me think of z-score for unusual. Expected range we'll get to in part C. Those are the keywords in here. Um, but we have a random sample of 115 college students. We asked how much they paid for their cell phone. And we have a mean of 107.79 and a standard deviation. Um, would it be unusual if a student got their phone for free? So unusual is z-score. We're going to take the data value. We're going to subtract the mean. And we're going to divide by standard deviation. This is a very important formula. You want to just accidentally memorize it because we'll use it so much. So my data value is how much did they pay for the phone. So free means they paid $0. The mean is 107.79, and the standard deviation is 83.12. Those were given. 115, the sample size, is not relevant to finding z-score. So we're going to plug this into the calculator. Um, 0 minus 107 is just negative 107. So negative 107.79 divided by 83.12 and we get a z-score of negative 1.29, and then six will round up to seven. It's within two standard deviations, so it's not unusual. If you go back to your notes, we learned in between negative two and two is normal or usual, and then anything on the outside is unusual. And so one point, negative 1.27 would be like right there. So that's okay. Um, how about part B? What if they paid $300 for their cell phone? So that just changes the formula. My data value is 300. The mean is still 107.79. And the standard deviation is still 83.12. So we're going to do 300 minus 107.79. I'm going to hit enter and then divide. Otherwise, the calculator might not be following order of operations. And I get a z-score of 2.312, which is slightly outside our normal range. It's beyond 2, so it is unusual. 
because it's more than two standard deviations. From the mean. We're always comparing things to the average. 300 is a bit expensive. Um, and then expected range, another formula we're going to use a lot. So it's the mean, or you can say mu, plus or minus two standard deviations, or plus or minus two sigma, whatever you like better. So we're going to take our mean, which was 107.79, and add two times the standard deviation. The two, again, is coming from 95% of the data is within two standard deviations. So we'll pull that calculator out again. Two times 83.12. So we get plus or minus 166.24. And I like to do the minus first. So negative 58.452. And then second enter, I can just change it to a plus sign to save some time to 274.03. Um, they're probably not paying you to get a phone, so it's probably just rounds to zero. Um, so zero to 274.03 would be my expected range. Yeah. Um, if it were discrete, we would round to whole numbers, but phone prices are continuous. So we're not going to round, but things to think about. All right, we just have a couple more. Um, you can skip around for the ones you need more help with. Um, we're going to look at a random sample of 274, um, and we want to find out how, what percent is within one standard deviation of the mean. So before we can answer that, we need to find the standard deviation and the mean. So I'm going to go ahead and put the number of TVs into L1. And I'm going to put the frequencies into L2, not including the total. Stat edit. Again, if you need to clear, you go to the top. Oops, I hit a button. You go to the top and hit clear. Enter. And so we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 TVs. And then the frequencies. Do not add the total. And then we'll go to stat, we'll go to one var stats under calc, and you need to make sure you tell it to look at frequencies. If you don't tell it to look at frequencies, it will not look at frequencies. So L1 comma L2, and I get a mean or X bar, because it's a sample of 2.1 TVs or 2.11. Um, 2.1 is enough, we just want one more than the data. Um, we're using X bar because it's a sample. And then we're going to use S again because it's a sample. 1.21387, we'll round up to 39. So sigma, this funny hat symbol, the next one is if we had a population. All right, so that's the first part. Now we want to find out what's within one Within makes me think of plus or minus, within one standard deviation of the mean. So 2.1 plus or minus 1.2139. It's similar to expected range, except expected range is times two. Um, we're specifically looking at one standard deviation, so we're not timesing by two. But two standard deviations would be times two, three would be times three. Um, we're just looking at one. So I like to, again, start with the subtraction because that's the smaller number. 1.2139, and then second enter tells me, um, lets me just change the minus sign to a plus sign, and we get 0.88613313139. All right, so let's see what we can do from here. So that means we're anywhere from 0.8861 to 3.3139. So let's figure out what numbers to include. So zero TVs doesn't quite make it. So we're not going to include zero. But one does make it because that's within the range. Two makes it. Three makes it. Four doesn't make it. And five doesn't make it. So we're just going to count how many people have one, two, or three TVs. And then divide by the total. Um, it's not three out of six. It's tempting to say three out of six. But there's 274 people. And we're going to add the frequencies. 
So let's see. We're gonna do 80 plus 85 plus 60. That's everyone who has one, two, or three TVs. So 225 out of 274 total. So 0.82, one, two, the one six rounds up to one, two, and we get 82.12%. All right, I'll just do two more with you, and that'll be it. Um, so we're gonna need the calculator for the last two as well. We're gonna look at 21 people who hiked um, to the top of Half Dome, and we wanna find the five number summary and make a box plot. So we could do it by hand, but we have the calculator, so why not? So we'll go to Stat, Edit, again, Clear, Enter. and type all the data. Um, double check for typos, it's definitely easy to miss one. Make sure you have 21. Order doesn't matter, the calculator will change the order if needed, but. If you go in order, it's easier to check for typos. Right, almost there. All right, so we have 21 and we'll go to stat, calc, one of our stats again. Make sure you don't have frequencies anymore because this one does not have frequencies. So just L1. And our five number summary, you might have to scroll down. It's min, Q1, median, Q3, and max. So we get 5.9, we get 10, 10.8, 11.6, and 13.9. Min, Q1, median, Q3, and max. All right, let's finish this up. So the IQR, um, these are just formulas you should have written down, but if you practice enough, sometimes you memorize them unintentionally. Q3 minus Q1, 11.6 minus 10, with or without a calculator, that's 1.6. And then we need to find the fences for outliers. So the lower is Q1 minus one and a half fences, min IQR, and then upper is Q3 plus one and a half IQR. So I'll get the calculator ready. So Q1 was 10 minus one and a half times 1.6. Um, you can type everything at once. If you're not typing everything at once, um, you do need to do the multiplication first. But since we have this calculator, we can type everything at once. But if you are not doing that, multiply comes first because of order of operations. So our lower fence is 7.6. Our upper fence is Q3, 11.6, plus one and a half times 1.6. So 11.6 plus one and a half times 1.6, and we get 14. All right, let's talk about what if we need the fences or not. So we need the fences if we have any data past them. So is there anything on the list past 7.6? Yes. 5.9 is less than 7.6, so 5.9 is now an outlier. 8.7 is fine because it's within the fence. And then lucky for us, 14 is be beyond all the data, so this one is not needed. 13.9 is within the range. So let's make a box plot. Um, this one looks easy enough to count by ones because we don't really have any big numbers. Um, if we wanted to find a scale, we usually do the max divided by like, I don't know, 8, 10, something like that. But because we, only, we start at 5 and end at 13, we can just count by ones. So we will do um, four. Um, for horizontal, it's okay to skip. Um, for vertical bars on histograms, we don't wanna skip because height would be misleading, but otherwise we don't have to start at zero. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and then I went a little too far over, so I'm gonna move it. All right, and then what are we measuring? We're measuring hike times in hours. And 
And then we just said that 5.9 is an outlier. So I'm going to mark it as an outlier. And then our box, let's start with the box. The box is the middle three numbers. So 10 for Q1, 10.8 for the median, and 11.6 for Q3. So we have a box, it's 1.6 wide from the IQR. And we have the end is Q1, the other end is Q3, median in the middle. And then we can make a tail to the max at 13.9. And then we, it's tempting to go all the way to the min, but we can't because remember there's a fence at 7.6, so we can't go past the fence. So we're going to go back up. What's the next largest number or, or smallest number? 8.7. So that's where our box will end. It's the min within the fence. So it's not the min min, it's the min that's within the fence. So that's a modified box plot. We never cross the fence. Cool, hope that helps. Um, this looks a little bit left skewed to me. Um, I know the tail on the left isn't long, but because of the outlier, it is a little left skewed. And then just as a reminder, remember box plots are 25%, 25, 25, 25. So that is important as well. So the 25% of the data is bigger than 11.6. 25% of the data is smaller than 10. Um, we have 50% right in between Q1 and Q3, just things to think about. Box plots break into 25s. All right, let's do one last example with linear regression. Um, our X's will go into L1 and our Y's will go into L2. And we'll just answer a few questions and we will be done with the practice test. So everything again is in stat edit. Uh, make sure you get all the X values in L1. Order does matter for regression because the 132 is paired with the 18. So we can't change the order. So we have six data values. And then enter the Y's. Go ahead and do regression if you remember how to do it. If there are repeats, they still matter um, because they're two different points. So we go to calc, we're gonna go down to eight. Um, it's nine on this one, but it's eight probably on the one you're using. And we'll tell it to look at L1 and L2. It's A plus BX, we like that order better. And we get a regression equation. Um, remember we use Y hat. We get 6.38, um, 6.4 is also okay. We just need one more decimal place than the data. These are my, when I say data, I mean the Y values. They have none, so this needs one. And then these have two digits, so this will need one, two, three digits. You can always add more if you're not sure. Um, these don't count, so the 904 are my three digits and then X. All right, let's answer a few questions and be done. Um, and then remember, if you don't have R and R squared, it means your diagnostics aren't on. So hopefully yours are already on, but if they're not, you go to catalog and you scroll all the way down to D for diagnostics and turn them on. And then if you do linear regression again, they should pop up. So make sure your diagnostics are on before the test. Um, we'll talk about those in a second. So if we want to interpret the slope, my slope is um, 0 0.0904, and then it's always over 1. Any number can be over 1. And then remember, it's the y values per 1x value. So y is speed, x is weight. So for each additional pound, Um, a wakeboarder prefers 0 0.09, 0 0.0904, and it looks like it's in miles per hour, more of speed. Or maybe their preference increases. It's kind of awkward to, let's say preference increases. It's a little bit awkward reading. Preference increases 
by 0.904 miles per hour. All right, let's find a prediction error. So prediction error is y minus y hat. Y is the actual data value. So this is saying someone who's 194 pounds, um, likes 22 miles per hour, that's coming from the table. This is my actual data value. So it's gonna be 22 minus something. And then y hat comes from the equation. So y hat is 6.4 plus 0 0.0904, and then we plug in the weight, 194, or the x value. Again, type it all in at once, and we get 23.9376, and so we'll do 22 minus this number. Um, remember, everything's an estimate, so our linear regression line is not perfect, it's just an estimate, so we're always off by a little bit. Statistics is all about being close, but not exact. So we're a little off. We're off by negative 1.9376. It just means we're a little under. Um, so let's use our equation to predict the speed for 150. So this is no longer error. This is only asking for y hat. And we're going to go ahead and plug in 150 pounds. And then you could type it again, or if you hit second enter a couple times, you can make something farther up pop up. So I hit second enter twice to get that to come back up and just type 150 instead of 194. And I get 19.96 miles per hour. Remember our Y is in miles per hour. That's coming from here. All right. And then let's just interpret R and R squared. So let me just write those down on this side. R squared is a nine two six. And R is 9448. I usually like four decimal places. And then they both round up. All right, so my correlation is R. So that means the correlation here is 0.9448. So we know there is a, and then we want to say strong, weak, moderate. I would say this is very strong because it's very close to one. And then we also want to say it's positive. That tells us it's going upward and increasing. And then linear correlation between our variables. And what are our variables? Let's make sure when we read the sentence, we know what we're talking about. So between the weight and speed of wakeboarders. And preferred speed. So make sure you talk about the variables as well. Um, the main thing is strong, positive, and linear. We only talk about linear, but there are other types of shapes and regression. All right, and then we'll interpret R squared, and we're out. So 0.8926. Um, so R squared is like that percent of variation. Um, so we'll say, I don't um, We know 89. 0.26% of the variation in the y variable. Um, what's our y variable? Our y variable was preferred speed. So that's my y variable. So why isn't the preferred speed the same for everyone? 89% um, of this is explained by the weight of a wakeboarder is explained by weight or the x variable in the linear regression equation. And so that's a good fit. 0% um, means weight isn't really have, have anything to do with speed. 89% means the weight is affecting the preferred speed a lot. And if you've ever wakeboarded, it should kind of make sense. Like the heavier you are, maybe it is a little bit easier to go a little faster. Um, just, yeah, so hopefully this helps. Um, keep practicing. Go to old assignments and stuff to get more practice if you need more from this. Good luck.